away you from me for parts. Hey. Hello. Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Animal Quest. Welcome to Animal Quest. Thank you for coming to the party. Patsy, hello. Somebody said that their professor is watching Animal Quest. Shout out the professor. I pray that you're not an entomology professor. Hearts, thank you for the prime. Um, no, I really am trying my best. <laughs> that would make me really nervous. Uh, that's a good question. Did you guys see that before I erased it? Thanks, Mick. You're not being graded. True. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. Um, okay, great. They saw <laughs> Very funny. Kaka. Everybody... Animal Quest, if you have not been here before, because I saw at least one person that said, oh, two people now. My first ever stream, this is my first time here. They said Pog, Animal Quest, and then there's also a professor who I assume has not been here before. If you have not been here for Animal Quest, Animal Quest is a series. This is the 19th episode, guys. We are, space reminded me, we are kind of coming up on the end of Animal Quest uh, without, without collecting more ambassadors right now. <laughs> so, it's a series where I create a presentation and I do a stream to spotlight one of the animals or one of the animal species that we have here at Alveus. Okay, Alveus, if you guys have seen the live cams, we're an animal sanctuary in Central Texas. We rescue non-releasable animals and we also have an invertebrate program. So we have lots of bugs. And today, Animal Quest is about isopods. Richard, thank you for the prime. There's live cams, oh yeah. There's live cams on all the enclosures 24-7 on the LVS channel if you want to go check it out. If you want to go see the other ambassadors we have, we have parrots, we have crows, we have foxes, we have chinchillas, we have donkeys, we have a cow, we have marmosets, little monkeys. They're pretty great. I just found your YouTube channel. Hello, welcome to the stream. Thanks for watching the YouTube videos. Any relation to Tide Pods? The isopods? No. My professor learned about your stream. She's an environmental professor at UT. Oh my god, that is terrifying. Okay, cool. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. What was up with your internet this week? I don't know. It rained and then we didn't have it for two days. That's how it goes out here sometimes. Shout out my professor. She's watching you. Hello, professor. Welcome to the stream. Elvis is the best. Hooray! I would like a grade afterwards, please. It's been a while. Not that long, but it's been a while <laughs> since I've received a grade. I would like to know how I'm doing. Um, I made a little presentation about isopods. We're going to talk about them. We, of course, have our isopod friends here today, so we're going to meet them. We have our zebra isopods. Marty is the name of every single one of them. We have our Spanish orange isopods named BB. You will get to meet them up close and personal in a second. Isopods are aliens, don't at me. Yeah, we have a lot of interesting things to learn about them today. Are you guys ready? Do you have any questions? Vet tech degree, good luck, nice. Any questions? Any questions? Are we ready to go? Are you ready to learn? Also, shout out if you're here right now. I heard Star something is coming out. Um... And thank you for being here for the isopods. They were really sad when I told them that, that there was some competition on Twitch this morning. But they're really excited that you guys are here instead. Star Wars. This is more important. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, we're, gonna, we're just going gonna, gonna to get right into it. Okay, first of all, who are our isopods? Okay, we have two isopod species here. Their names are Marty and Bibi. Who are they? This is who they are. This is not the beginning of the video. This is the, this is. Uh, 
I don't even know how to... I don't know how to do this. I don't see, like, a slider. <laughs> I got an F. Technology, you know? You know how it is. I'll explain the video to you in a second. Yay, it's Marty. Guys, this is a Marty party. Nobody say ew, if you say ew, you're getting banned. These are the Mediterranean version of the roly poly that you normally see that's only oh, gray. Oh, my cousins. These are zebra ice. Oh my God, it scared me. I thought there's an S from Hooray! video. Hey, they're stripey. Look how fun and cute. Oh, stripey. They break down decaying matter like to make it into soils that something. we can use to grow other things. They're very, very important. Uh, for breaking down organic matter. So sick. Wait, so is an armadillo an isopod? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I don't really know what happened with that video, uh, but the essence is that we ordered zebra isopods. We ordered 10 zebra isopods, and in our container of 10 zebra isopods there was one spanish orange isopod for some reason think one curly fry in your regular fries and that one spanish orange isopod has now turned into hundreds so now we have two separate colonies okay of uh isopod species the first one is our zebra isopods like you saw in this video okay this is marty like I said in that video, this is this is a Mediterranean version of the roly-poly that you see all the time. There are lots of species of isopods. I'm not going to tell you how many because that is uh, one of the poll questions today, and that would be leaking. But they're really cool. Look, they have stripes. And we started with like 10 of them. They're very prolific. They do a very good job. They're, yeah, there's so many. Okay. That's Marty. And this is BB. We have less of, of these, but there's still plenty. Okay. This is BB. This is Spanish orange isopod. See, it's a really poly, except orange. Kind of cool, huh? Kind of cool. I don't want to pick that one. This one? Yay! Here's our curly fry. BB. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Those are our isopods. You will see them again later in this stream. Max made that video. Shout out, Max. Sorry. It didn't really work. All right. What is isopod? What is an isopod? I've never seen an orange one. So cool. There are so many. Let's learn a little bit about where they came from and what they are. Shout out PBS. Look how cute. Are you kidding me? Look how cute. These little eyeballs. Pill bugs. Roly polies. These are like potato bugs. Whatever you want to call them, somehow there's something less creepy about these guys than other insects. More lovable or something. Maybe it's because they're not insects at all. Pill bugs are actually crustaceans. They're more closely related to shrimp and lobsters than crickets or beetles. Pill bugs even taste like shellfish if you cook them right. No! Some adventurous foragers call them wood shrimp. As early as 300 million years ago, some intrepid ancestor crawled out of the ocean, sensing there might be more to eat or less competition on dry land. But unlike lobsters, pill bugs can roll up into a perfect little ball for protection. If you look closely, you can see the evidence of where these guys came from. 
Like their ocean-dwelling cousins, pill bugs still use gills to breathe. Chat what it was called. True insects, like this cricket, use a totally different system. See those tiny holes on this cricket's abdomen? Not just They're called lungs, spiracles. What kinds of lungs? They lead to a series of tubes that bring fresh air directly to the insect's Think cells. A but pill bugs don't have any of that. To survive yeah, on land, Betty. they had to adapt. Pleopodal lungs. Their gills, called pleopods, are modified to work in air. Almost leaves Folds the in the pleopod gills developed into hollow branched structures, almost like tiny lungs. In a way, the pill bug is only halfway to becoming a true land animal. Amazing. Because they're still gills. They need to be kept moist in order to work. Which is why you usually find pill bugs in moist places. Like under damp, rotting logs. They can't venture too far away. Sure, pill bugs look like the most ordinary of bugs. But they're much more than that. Evidence that over evolutionary time, species make big, life-changing leaps. And those stories are written on their bodies. Hey, while we're on the subject of oddball crustaceans, check out this episode about mantis shrimp. All right. So that is what an isopod is. OK, they're crustaceans. They are invertebrates, they are arthropods, but they are not insects, they're not arachnids, they're crustaceans. So they're more closely related to crabs, lobsters, uh, than they are than they are other insects. Do we eat them? Uh, apparently some people do. Apparently uh, people forage for them and call them wood shrimp. Uh, from what I understand, they taste more like shrimp, or they taste like shrimp because they're crustacean. They do look like a lobster tail, they kind of do. Um, so, yeah, there you go. They have pleopodal lungs because they start started out in the water. We are gonna talk about marine isopods because there are still marine isopods, big ones. Um, speaking of big ones, bugs used to be really, really big. Did you guys know that? Let me warn you before I play this video. This video, this this Animal Quest does have a couple videos just because I found a couple really good ones. There's like a really tragic scene in here and it made me very sad and it might traumatize you. I just want to warn you. But you'll be fine. Um, yeah, bugs used to be really, really big. Find out how and why. Let's see. 358 million years ago, the continents came together we to play form Arc, the we know. supercontinent. Oh. Okay. Pangaea. This was the beginning of the Carboniferous period. Oxygen levels in the air were much higher back then. 35% compared to today's 21%. For the first time on Earth, giant trees stored carbon dioxide and released oxygen in abundance. Human beings would not have survived in this high oxygen atmosphere. But for some swamp dwellers, it was ideal. Who's the camera? Like Alpha Pleura, measuring up Dude. to 10 feet. This long lost cousin of the centipedes was a herbivore. There used to be millipedes that were two meters long and a half meter wide. With a wingspan up to 25 inches, this member of the dragonfly family is the largest known flying insect ever discovered. That's a large pigeon. A tireless predator. It Besides had no airborne dragonfly. competitors at the time since birds and flying reptiles didn't exist yet. What the proof? Fossils. <laughs> I would just pass out. It's my dream. The high oxygen levels in the atmosphere give the characteristic sepia color to the sky during the Carboniferous period. Oxygen also makes the air extremely flammable. No. No, don't go. Don't go up there. The air is flammable. 
Such a hostile world is hard for us to imagine. Lightning storms could set aflame the immense forests and their inhabitants. <laughs> During this period, not a day went by without huge forest fires, and yet giant insects thrived. Later, when fires became less frequent, these astonishing creatures simply disappeared. Scientists are trying to determine what caused that extinction. Such a dramatic animation. Was that real? This no. is what the French region of Allier would have looked like then. A giant swamp scattered with cypresses. Humidity at nearly 100% made the atmosphere dense and allowed Meganeura to easily carry its heavy exoskeleton into the air. It is part of a genus that is extinct today, but it looks much like modern dragonflies and is part of the same Odonatoptera superorder. With wings that functioned independently of each other, Meganeura was agile in flight, but unlike its contemporary cousins, it couldn't fold its wings. Faced with this efficient airborne predator, vegetarian insects such as Paleodictyoptera had to keep themselves out of sight. By comparing its anatomy to modern dragonflies, we can guess at Meganeura's main physical characteristics. One, it could fly over 40 miles per hour. 40? 40? Two, it was a sight predator. Its head was independent from the rest of its exoskeleton, so it That's could keep be it like still while flying and focus on its drive. prey. Okay. What's, what's 40 miles Three, out of Three, it had a drive. huge appetite. It could eat its own weight in food every 30 minutes. I always minutes. get that backwards, don't I? To catch all Wait. this food, Meganeura had an array of attributes identified no. in fossils. 60, 70, 60, 60 kilometers per hour? But what That's might fast. explain its giant size? Are dragonflies ice spots? No, they're not. Um, okay, so I wanted to show you guys that video because one, it's just so interesting that bugs used to be so, so big, right? Um, now they're much smaller. Uh, they're still trying to figure out exactly why that is. The oxygen concentration in the air that long ago, uh, was much higher than it is now, uh, because lots of things have happened to our planet. Uh, we have less trees than we used to. We have more decomposers, uh, than we used to. And so the oxygen levels are lower. Uh, so we have smaller bugs, but in the ocean, uh, we still have giant isopods. Isopods that have deep sea gigantism. Um, and they are still the size that they would have been back then, uh, which is just really interesting. So I want to show you guys that video so then we can now transition into giant marine isopods. The isopods that I showed you here are what? Oh my gosh. Divna. Did Divna do a fundraising stream? Divna must have done a fundraising stream because she just donated $1,500. She had a fundraising stream. Thank you so much. That is awesome. Thank you so much. That is so cool. Thank you for the $1,500 donation and for doing a fundraising stream for us. That is wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Trickster, thank you for the prime. Um, so the isopods that I showed you today, they're very small, right? Like that big? Like that big? Um, guess how big giant marine isopods are? Yes. Palms, thank you for the three months. Big, one foot. Good guess. Yeah. About a foot long. Um, they can be a foot to like 15 or 16 inches long, um, which for actual reference, I'm getting a ruler, is this long? This is a foot long. Um, so they're really big, and I really, I'm going to be honest, I wish our isopods were this big, because I think it would be really fun. But they're only this big, 
in the ocean right now. You guys want to see what they look like? This is a giant isopod. Get out of the way. Oh, it is eating a fish head. Yay, yum. Ah! <laughs> oh my god, how cool. Look at his under stuff. You can see his swimmerettes. He's swimming away. He doesn't want us to steal his food. He's this big. The little pill bugs. The roly poly bugs. He's swimming. He used to play with his kids. This is a relative of that. It's just a giant version. He's probably about 20 centimeters long. They get huge. They could be up to like what a foot, a foot and a half long. This one in particular. I don't know if anyone's this ever big. aged them. <laughs> they have existed for more than 160 million years, though. I can tell you that. They make plushies of them. <laughs> That's true. I'm just saying that would be a great Christmas gift. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. So there are giant marine isopods. Um, there's pretty incredible diversity in isopods. We're going to talk about that in a second. Again, I'm not going to tell you how many species there are because it's coming up in a poll question. Okay. Um, but yeah, just so you know, isopods can be really big. Diversity. Okay. Again, not going to tell you because it's coming up in a poll question. But look, there's so many different types of isopods. We got our zebra isopods there. I actually don't know the names of all of these isopods. There's a giant purple isopod on the top left. There's a giant marine isopod on the bottom, but they can be spiky boys. Um, actually, our Spanish orange isopods are spiky if you look at them with a macro lens. You can't see the spikes with your naked eye because they're so little. When you put a macro lens on them, they are spiky boys, which is very cool. So, they're ecological niche. Um, they're detritivores. Okay, by the way, I've been saying detrit. I think I say detritivore. Detritivore? I say detritivore. But then a bunch of people I've heard have said detritivore. So I'm going to start saying detritivore. Animals that feed on detritus. <laughs> Decaying animal or plant matter. Okay, so examples of detritivores. Earthworm, isopod. Dung beetle, a classic, a millipede, starfish, marine detritivores, all very important. Okay, they're nature's cleanup crew. They clean things up. What exactly uh, is a detritivore and what do they do for us? This. And I think this is the last video for today. Saw a dung beetle the other day. I love dung beetles. Detritivores are an important group of organisms that play a crucial role in ecosystems by consuming and breaking down dead organic matter. They help to decompose dead plants and animals, contributing to the recycling of nutrients in the environment. It's Australia. important to note the difference between decomposers and detritivores. While both groups are involved in the breakdown of organic matter, Decomposers are primarily <laughs> made up of microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. No, he's not sure. Whereas detritivores are animals that feed directly on dead material. Detritivores can be found in various habitats, including forests, grasslands, and aquatic ecosystems. Starfish. They consume decaying organic matter such as leaves fallen trees, animal carcasses, and other debris. By doing so, they break down complex organic compounds into simpler forms, facilitating the release of nutrients back into the environment. Common examples of detritivores include earthworms, termites, Simon, thank you. millipedes, wood lice, and dung beetles. Earthworms are often seen burrowing through soil, ingesting and breaking down dead plant material as they move. They help to enhance soil fertility by breaking down organic matter, improving soil structure and facilitating nutrient recycling. Millipedes and woodlice are arthropods found in various terrestrial habitats. 
Woo, wood lice. They feed on decaying leaves and plant matter, yeah. contributing to the decomposition process. These organisms play a vital role in nutrient recycling, helping to release nutrients locked within dead plant material. Termites are insect detritivores. They feed on dead wood, leaf litter, and other plant debris, converting it into simpler forms and releasing nutrients into the environment. Termites have a special ability to digest cellulose, a complex carbohydrate found in plant fibres. Dung beetles, as their name suggests, consume and break down animal waste such as dung. They assist in the decomposition of faecal matter, which not only helps with waste removal, but also aids in nutrient cycling. By burying dung underground, dung beetles also contribute to soil health and nutrient availability. Yay, dung beetles! Detritivores are important components of ecosystems, as they contribute to the recycling of nutrients, energy flow, and overall ecosystem balance. Their feeding activities help to break down organic matter, returning valuable nutrients to the environment and making them available for other organisms to utilise. Hooray! So, don't yeah. forget to subscribe. Australians. So, um, they are very important for nutrient recycling. Okay, our isopods, also someone said wood lice, yeah. Isopod, roly poly, wood lice, pill bug. Do you guys have any other names that you call them? They're called lots of things. They go by lots of names. Bench biters? What? What? Oh, that's actually a thing. Potato boys, potato bug, roly poly. That's what they're called in Denmark. Interesting. Cool. <laughs> you know, okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, uh, they, um, they go by lots of different names, but they're all very important and they all do the same thing, and that's break down organic matter to make it into soils and make it into simpler elements that we can use to grow things or that the world, can, the earth can use to grow things. Um, if we didn't have them, we would just have a bunch of organic ma matter piling up um, and not breaking down and our world would not be habitable. So detritivores are very, very important. Um, <laughs> came over here to talk about this one. Adaptations. Um, you know what? Let me do this over here. Isopods have a lot of very unique adaptations that make them very cool. The first one that we'll talk about is drink from butt. Here's an isopod, right? You recognize him? Little legs. Little legs. He's smiling. And he has these. You seen these on the back of isopods? This? You guys know what I'm talking about? I'm going to see if I can show you on an isopod. Let me see. I would like to borrow one of you. That's a bad example. Maybe you can, if you can see them easier on the Spanish orange, we'll do that. If you can't, then, oh yeah, well, those are definitely more prominent. Okay, let me, can I borrow one of y'all? I was talking to the ice spots, but I do need your help. All right. Sure. Like your hair. Yeah, we match. Okay, so you guys are going to have to look really close. It's also kind of harder to see BB. You see those on the back, those little spiky things on the back of BB there? Can you tell? Yeah, 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 yeah. You see them. Those are called Europods. The spikies right there. Those spikies, they're called Europods. Um, it's a tube-like structure on the anus of isopods, uh, and they can drink through them. Um, they can absorb water, moisture through capillary, via capillary action, and they can drink through their butt. Uropods, everyone. 
Butt straw. Humans can do that too? Yeah, but not as easily. So, um, yeah, fun fact, they drink from butt. Okay, another fun ice pod adaptation. No peach, only ammonia, okay? Um, isopods do not urinate, okay? They do produce fecal matter that a lot of times they will eat because they're detritivores and they recycle nutrients, but they don't peach. That doesn't mean they don't produce the waste products that everything else produces with pee. They do produce ammonia. Instead of peeing it out, they release it in a gaseous form through their pores. <laughs> um, so... The butt straws are called Europods, U-R-O-P-O-D. So instead of peeing, they release uh, gaseous ammonia through their pores. Cool, try that sometime. All right, um, adaptation number three, uh, blood blue. Isopods uh, do not have hemoglobin in their blood, they have hemocyanin, which means when exposed to oxygen, it is blue instead of turning red. Gotta show us that one? No, I will not. I refuse. Rockwich, thank you. Um, and two other ones. Roll. You guys have seen an isopod roll. I don't know if I can give you a demonstration. I, I bet I can. I'm gonna try again. Try to do another demonstration here. Um, I need one isopod, please. Why are you guys so hard to pick up? I don't want to squish. Um, when they roll, it's called con con conglobation. Conglo conglobation, um, which the definition of that word is uh, just combining miscellaneous thing into a more or less rounded mass. You guys don't really need a demonstration of this because I think everyone knows that they can do this. He doesn't want to. He doesn't. He doesn't want to roll. He's. Okay. They really only do it when they're scared and he's just. He just doesn't really care. <laughs> but you guys know what it looks like when a roly poly rolls up. Okay. I tried. I tried. He's not interested. He's not interested. <laughs> um, so they can roll up and then also, of course, my favorite is the pleopodal lungs. Uh, ice pods have pleopodal lungs. They're more like gills than they are lungs. It is uh, like that picture on the back end of isopods, right on top or near their uropods. So if this is an upside down isopod with his little legs and he's smiling, his antenna, oh, he's upside down though. His lungs, his pleopodal lungs would be here, down here. Um, and they absorb oxygen through their lungs. They have to stay moist for them to be able to breathe. That is how they breathe. Kind of cool, huh? kind of cool. So, lots of fun isopod adaptations. Very cool, very fun, very fun. Um, invertebrate conservation. Let's talk a little bit about invertebrate conservation because it's very important and it's one of my favorite things to talk about, okay? Okay, um, number one, one thing that you guys should know if you don't already know, if you haven't watched the stream before, even though I say it all the time, um, invertebrates make up 97% of our animal species on the planet. An invertebrate is anything without a spine. It is not just insects. It is not just isopods. Um, you must be fun at parties. Oh yeah, I have all the icebreakers. I love talking about invertebrates. Um, it, invertebrates are a lot of different things, okay? Corals are invertebrates. Earthworms are invertebrates. Uh, sea sponges are invertebrates. Insects are invertebrates, arachnids are invertebrates, jellyfish are invertebrates, isopods are invertebrates, okay? There's lots of different types. Vertebrates is anything with a spine, 
birds, reptiles, mammals, right? Um, when you think of an animal, you probably think of a vertebrate. Ferrets are vertebrates. So, invertebrates, no spine, make up 97% of our animal species on this planet, okay? There are about 70,000 described species of vertebrates. That is all birds, reptiles, and mammals combined. 70,000 invertebrates, over 1.25 million recognized species compared to 70,000 vertebrates. Okay, invertebrates absolutely rule our planet. And they're very, very, very important. That's a lot. I know. And that's also described species. There are so many species that are not described yet. Uh, also that we're never going to describe because they're going to go extinct before you find them. How many are there? This is not about invertebrates as a whole because that number would be outrageous. How many insects are there per person on the planet. Insects are defined by having a three-segmented body and three pairs of legs. Is it 10 million, 100 million, 200 million, or 500 million insects per person on the planet? What do you think? A, B, C, or D? What do you think? I swear you did this one before. Okay, get out of my business. How about that? It's always C, okay. D, because that seems wild. You just type A, B, C, or D. Most people are thinking C, 200 million. 48% are saying C, 200 million insects per person on the planet. 48% of you are correct. About 200 million insects per person on the planet. For you. 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 There's 200 million insects. And for your friend, there's 200 million insects. These are insects, you guys. Not invertebrates. Insects. Spiders are not insects. They're arachnids. Isopods are not insects. They're crustaceans. <laughs> okay? There's so many. All right. How many species of isopods are there? I've been talking, I've been really talking up their, uh, their diversity, how diverse they are, uh, but I haven't given you the number because of this poll. How many species of isopods do you think there are? Do you think there's a thousand species? Do you think there's 10,000 species? Do you think there's a hundred thousand species? Or do you think there are a million species of isopods? For reference, we have two species here. <laughs> what do you think? A, B, C, or D? A, B, C, or D. And a million undiscovered more. I like the attitude. I like the attitude, yes. All right, most people saying 10,000. 56% saying 10,000. Uh, you are correct. There's about 10,000 species of just isopods. Just isopods. You guys, like, these two that we have, 10,000 more that we know of that are just different kinds of isopods. For reference, for how diverse that is for one order, birds are a class. How many species of birds are there? This is all birds from emus and ostriches to penguins and songbirds and finches. Crows, eagles, falcons, hawks. Is it a thousand species of birds? 10,000 species, a hundred thousand species, or a million species? Most of you are saying A. 55% saying A. The correct answer is the same amount of species of isopods. This is a huge deal because bird, av aves, avis, avis is a class. There's so many different types of birds, right? 10,000 species across things from like hummingbirds to freaking bald eagles, right? 10,000. Just isopods, 10,000. Just beetles, by the way, beetles. Like, 
a ladybug, right? 290,000 species of beetles identified, described, but there are way more. <laughs> My point is that there is incredible diversity in the world of invertebrates <laughs> um, compared to vertebrates, yet vertebrates are more charismatic uh, people like when they think of animals they think of birds and they think of pandas and they think of polar bears and they think of tigers and stuff like that and that's great um, but the percentage of the diversity that they hold on our planet is remarkably low these guys rule the world uh, and we don't realize it and we don't think about them enough am i making my point is this a children's channel? Might as well be one and child if you're a baby. <laughs> Lori, thank you. Um, point made. You guys get it? There's so many of them. So cool. Oh no, there's a bunch of babies. Okay. So invertebrate conservation is very, 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 very important. Why? Should we care about invertebrate conservation? Because without them, we would die. Okay? If we had a war, who would win? Not even a question. <laughs> okay? If humans went extinct, invertebrates would thrive. They would thrive. They would do great. They would just break down all of our decaying bodies and be so happy and thrilled if we lost invertebrates we all die okay and that's not just detritivores that are breaking down all of our organic matter so it's not piling up around us invertebrates are also pollinators so much of what we consume comes from plants we don't have flowering plants we don't have fruits we don't have vegetables without pollinators uh, these plants need to be pollinated to produce those things for us to eat we die we die So, our insects are very important. The IUCN red list states that less than 400 insect species are extinct. Pfft. First of all, <laughs> okay. The other sad thing about insect conservation and vertebrate conservation, one, they're very hard to count, okay? Uh, I will admit, it's, it's hard to, it's easier to go out and count a mammal than it is to go and find all the bugs okay <laughs> it's like hard to to figure it out but the other problem is that invertebrate conservation just doesn't get enough press and doesn't get enough support to be able for the research to be done because people don't like bugs people want to support tiger conservation they want to support panda conservation they want to support orangutan conservation but no one's going to be like yeah i i would like to donate to isopod conservation please because they're like it's just a bug it's just a bug the iucn only lists 400 insect species as being extinct. 400. Scientists today, entomologists today, think it's possible that several dozen species disappear each week. Each week. Granted, a lot of invertebrates, because the diversity is so huge, have a very small range, right? There are millipede species that only live in certain parks in like Virginia or something, right? Like there's, they have a limited space. But if you take that space, you wipe it all out and put a building there, you may have just made an insect species or some kind of arthropod species go extinct. Um, there are tons of them that are going extinct all the time. Who knows how many a year? And also so many of them that we haven't even identified yet. We don't even know they exist. Right? Because people just don't care about bugs. They're just not interested in supporting invertebrate conservation. It is so important. We need them uh, because they are pollinators. Again, like I said, um, they are pest control. I know that sounds confusing because it's like bugs are pests. There are a lot of carnivorous bugs. And if we didn't have carnivorous bugs eating other bugs and keeping other bug populations in check, we would be overtaken by bugs, okay? So they're pest control, they're nutrient cycling. We could not use our soils. We could not grow things. We could not survive without detritivores. There are lots of different types of detritivores like you guys saw, it's not just isopods. Um, and seed dispersal. 
just like I talk about with, with the foxes and with the marmosets. Um, they're really important for dispersing seeds as well so that we can have forest regrowth, so we can have plant regrowth elsewhere. Um, so that is why we should care about bugs. Look, he's crying also, by the way, because he's really sad that no one cares about invertebrate conservation. <coughs> okay, a lot of people are asking about mosquitoes. <laughs> like, I should really just do a whole thing on mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes uh, are a huge risk to human health. A lot of people die of mosquito-borne illnesses all the time. Uh, mosquitoes, a lot of species of mosquitoes are pollinators. I will say that much. There are lots of different types of pollinators. Mosquitoes do pollinate things. They don't just bite you. Um, I haven't done that much research on mosquitoes to know much enough about them. Um, but I will say any species that goes extinct anywhere, other species go extinct too. You can't just be like, yep, yeah, that one can go. Sure, there would be detrimental effects to all mosquito species going extinct on the planet. But I know you guys don't like them. Recommendations. Recommendations for you guys to help support these bugs, okay? Number one, be kind to bugs. It's important. Look, it says he's telling you to hurry and be kind to bugs, okay? Um, we, don't need to, we don't need to scream every time we see a five millimeter long bug. Um, we don't need to squish every bug that we see just because we happen to see it. They're there anyway, right? Um, just, just, just be nicer to bugs. Notice them too. Um, if you, one of the things that helped me a lot in getting into bugs and insects and starting to like them more is just looking at them up close. You don't have to like hold them up to your face, right? But if you just take a second and look at them, a lot of times they're really cool. If you ever come across a jumping spider, please, I beg you, just watch him for like five minutes. They are so cute and so funny. And if you like snap above them, they look up. If you like move your hand over there, they're like, what's that? <laughs> they're like little puppies. It's really cool. Okay, it's really cute. That worked for my nephew. Cute. Yeah, great. Um, but a lot of insects are really, really cool. Uh, really cool to watch. I held a stick bug for like five minutes the other day and it was, it was sick very cool um research pesticides and natural alternatives before applying um pesticides we've talked about are bad for a lot of reasons they don't just affect bugs toast's favorite food is snails right um if we applied pesticides to a plant and the snail ate that pesticide and died and then toast ate that snail toast is going to get sick too because toast will have ingested pesticides uh, so there are lots of natural alternatives that you can try cracked eggshells uh, are one of those alternatives garlic um is it, I think, cayenne pepper? Whatever the bug is that you're trying to get rid of, look up some natural alternatives and just give it a shot first, see if those will work. Um, that would be great. Protect forest habitats by supporting parks and respecting wild spaces. Um, I don't know where you are in the world, but there's lots of ways to, to support the conservation of local spaces, local parks, uh, local protected areas. That would be really cool. Um, Oh, say no to cringe lawns. What's a cringe lawn? A cringe lawn is a lawn that's just grass. <laughs> that's, a cr that's what a cringe lawn is. Any lawn. Lawns are cringe. You want to know why? Because it looks pretty. It looks like this. This is turf, right? In the front of someone's house, they take probably like a dozen or more species of native plant that were there before, pull them out and put in one invasive monocrop, one plant. So now the dozens of insects that could live on all the plants that were there before either die or have to go somewhere else. <laughs> if you don't cut it, you get into trouble. You realize that, right? Hey guys, I'm not necessarily saying like stick it to your HOA. There are ways though to do, to plant native things. You can take out part of your lawn and you can landscape native plants, uh, you know, if you got a cringe HOA. But uh, lawns are just really lame. It's just another way to take what could be pollinator habitat, insect habitat, and just wipe it out and put up grass that nothing can use for anything except for your dog to pee on. Um, we could be making a ton of invertebrate and pollinator habitat. What is HOA? Do they not have that outside of America? HOA is a homeowners association. It's, cringe. they're cringe and they require you to make your house look a certain way so that 
it doesn't stick out in the neighborhood. And so other people, when they try to sell their houses, don't get screwed over because your house that's next to them is ugly. They like, r they like report you for not putting your trash cans away or like painting your door a fun color or whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, that's what HOA is. Uh, and then uh, teach your friends about bugs. I don't know, talk to your friends about bugs. When your friend is like, ew, my guy's a spider, just be like, hey, he's my friend. Or tell people anything that you learned today. You can be like, hey, you go to a party and go up to a pretty girl and say, hey, did you know that ice pods can drink through their anus? And then start talking to her about isopod conservation. Um, or you can say, did you know that uh, ice pods taste like shrimp? Really pulleys taste like shrimp? Or that they're a uh, crustacean? Did you know that invertebrates make up 97% of our animal species on this planet? You could talk to your friends about bugs, you know? You could do that. I don't think I can do that with spiders. Well, try. <laughs> try! Did you try? Yes. And we've been together for over a year. Yeah. So yeah, it is, yep. Big time. I will try, big. Um. Yeah, oh shoot, we do have a Q&A. Um, I forgot to put a little section in this in my, in my presentation, but yeah, we will do a Q&A. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can type hashtag ask followed by your question, and I will try to answer some of them. When IRL vlog with Pangolin? Uh, I don't have that planned. I don't know if that's possible. Thank you for the tier one. All right, we are going to open this Q&A again. If you guys have questions, you can do hashtag ask followed by your questions. And then, and then I will answer them. All righty. All righty, let's see. Um, 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 um. Okay. Uh, turtle said, do they drown? They would. Yeah, if you, uh, put them in water, they would die. Uh, if that's, if that's your question. Um, don't they need air in these boxes? Yes, uh, these boxes have holes in the tops of them that were drilled in there. Um, 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 um. If you find ice pods in your garden, is that a good sign that your garden is healthy? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you, if you plant something, you will find detritivores there helping break stuff down. Um, I don't know much about gardening, to be honest, or like to know what the health of your garden is, but it's definitely a good thing to have, to have detritivores in there. Um, da, 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 da. do you have to miss those containers to keep them moist? Yes. These are also temporary containers. Um, the isopods have glass terrariums. They're in here right now because we're treating our reptiles for mites and so they can't be inside that room. Um, but yeah, we do have to miss the enclosures. They have to stay moist, uh, for those pleopodal lungs to work. Um, because they're crustaceans. So, yes, we do, we do miss them. I should do a whole thing on this. How come bees have all the pollination glory? One, I, you know what, I don't know how... I don't know how much like pollinating if you can compare those things of what like bees do and like butterflies do and stuff like that because butterflies are also pollinators. Um, I don't know if bees are like really aggressive pollinators and just do a ton of it. I will say 
bees have a fascinating conservation story uh, because the Save the Bees movement is the only time that I've seen people stoked about invertebrate conservation in any in any way. I don't know if it's because they're marketed well. I don't know if it's because they're they're not. They have a great PR team. But when you look at them up close, they're not particularly cute. I don't know if it's cute because they have the stripes, but so does Marty, right? And like butterflies are really pretty and no one's gotten like, I, I mean, people do kind of get behind monarch conservation, I guess. The bee movie, Honey, maybe, yeah. The other thing about bees is that people say save the bees and then they go around thinking that they should be saving European honeybees, in the States anyway, which are invasive. Uh, but then they don't really care about native bees. It's very confusing. <laughs> People are like, save the bees, and then they go and like save invasive bee species that kill our native bee species. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing to look into. It's a fascinating story about conservation and very interesting for from like a marketing perspective or a PR perspective. How do you feed them? These guys get a variety of fruits and vegetables. They get uh, sweet potato, zucchini, um... They get carrots sometimes. They, I've seen them get lettuce, apples. They also eat crab exoskeleton. We get that. We order that. Dried peas, like freeze dried peas. Bee pollen as well. They get lots of, lots of stuff. They eat lots of stuff. Do 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 do. Why do isopods go by so many names? I think it's just because they're everywhere. There's so many different species, and so many people know them and see them. They just call them different things depending on where they are. Uh, I'm only answering this one because I've seen it. I've seen lanternflies come up a couple times. Uh, how do you think we should deal with spotted lanternflies? If you're in a place where you have spotted lanternflies, they're like a notoriously invasive species, uh, you can squash them because um, that's what's, that's what's got to be done. Uh, they're mostly, I think they're mostly on the East Coast, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, they're really beautiful, but they are detrimental to native species. How can you make your lawn less cringe? Plant native plants. Yay! Plant native plants, pollinator gardens, uh, be really cool. Maybe just take even like a section of your lawn out and like line it with rocks and put like some milkweed in there. Oh, so cool. Be so cool. And it would look so pretty. And if they're native, you don't have to worry about like giving them gallons and gallons of water a day so that they survive because they're native. So they're supposed to live there. <laughs> so they're easy to keep alive. It's huge. Uh, isopods are neither venomous nor poisonous. I are species of isopods. I have not studied all 10,000. I don't think there are any species that are venomous or poisonous, though. Technically, I, ha I didn't look that up. Um. Um, how do we tell homeowners that their lawn just cringe without hurting their feelings? <laughs> um, um, here's a really, here's a really nice, really non-confrontational way to do it that probably wouldn't work. But like, you can buy native seed packets. You can buy, well, okay, I have two options. I, I have a really nice non-confrontational non method and I have kind of a, a terrorist method. My first one is you can buy like native seed packets and you can be like, here, I got you some native wildflowers. Uh, they're really pretty and they pop up really easy and you can spread them anywhere. Or, or you could get that you could get those native seed packets okay you could get some dirt you could 
mold them into balls, okay? And then you could put them in Tupperware in your car and you could drive around, you could drive by, <laughs> and you could, <laughs> you could throw them out the window into people's lawns. <laughs> Is there any reason I shouldn't recommend that? Okay, I, <laughs> Ella and I have talked about doing that with milkweed, legitimately. We were gonna do it last year, but you have to like, har I'm not joking. She said I'm joking, I'm actually not. Um, maybe I am, is that, not, is that irresponsible? I don't know, as long as they're native, I don't see a problem with that. Just it's a hypothetical. It's just native seeds, what they're gonna, they're gonna disperse anyway. Okay, do them along the road, then not on someone's lawn. No, just say we're talking about this hypothetically. We're talking about this hypothetically. But personally, I would. <laughs> Next question. Do you plan on getting more... Ella, what's your opinion on seed bombing? Yeah. Use actually native wildflower seeds. A lot of companies. She said use actually native wildflower seeds. A lot of companies get native wildflower seed mix and they don't take into account where you're actually located. Start with milkweed. Make sure it's native milkweed. There are yeah, lots of different types. There's a lot of um, seed mixes that are advertised for like monarchs, but what they actually, um, but the seed seeds that are there are good mix. Plant milkweed. Um, do you plan on getting more arachnids? Yes. Uh, we plan, we have all the stuff to get a tarantula. Um, we want to do a rose hair tarantula uh, for, to start with. Could large bugs come back, Prage? I wish, but the honest answer is that will probably never happen considering uh, the levels of carbon in our atmosphere. The reason we were able to have such large bugs is because there was so much oxygen in our atmosphere. We're kind of having the opposite problem <laughs> now. I don't see a world where uh, it, it 180s and we start getting big bugs back. Um... The largest isopod apparently can be about a foot and a half. This is a foot, so like another, another half foot, it's so like this big, something like that. Why are people so afraid of bugs? It's a great question don't really know. I think it's something that starts when we're little. Um, I know babies come out of the womb not afraid of anything. Like, you could put fire there, and I really think they would grab it. Like, they're not... I don't think it's a, it's a nature thing. I think it's a nurture thing. My little... My niece, um, her parents are not afraid of bugs. Um, but uh, she... Her teacher at school is. She's almost three and she went to school and there was a spider in the classroom and her teacher saw the spider and was like ah there's a spider like get it out get it out whatever uh she came home and she wouldn't sleep that night because she saw a spider in her room <laughs> it really matters how we talk to kids about bugs in particular because it it starts there um and then kids grow up being p adults that are afraid of bugs and are afraid of spiders uh, and yeah, sure, there are feelings of disgust. There are, they don't make cute noises like other animals. They're smaller, so we don't get to see their expression like other animals. Some spiders are dangerous. It's smart to have kids be aware about bugs. All raccoons are dangerous. But you don't have kids being like, ah, you did a raccoon outside! <laughs> you know, like, they're just like, oh my god, it's a raccoon! Uh, I don't know. Um, I think a lot of it is an attitude thing. Um, and I think a lot of it is talking about them, why they're important, and why we don't need to be scared of all of them. So, yeah. Um, all right, all right, all right, all right. Fireflies are, in fact, real.
do 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 I think having an aquarium with giant isopods would be exceptionally difficult. I have only seen giant isopods in captivity one time, and it was the it was at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And if any aquarium in the world can keep something that's hard to keep, it would be the Monterey Bay Aquarium, in my personal opinion, as someone from the coast of California. <laughs> um, but it's just, I, I would be too scared that I would kill them. Also, I don't know that there's something that you can acquire uh, without like very, very, very special permits. Um, but it would be crazy. It would be very, very cool. Um, all right, let's see. A couple more questions. A couple more questions. Um, I'm, we're flashing. Favorite bioluminescent animal or organism? I love dinoflagellates. It's a bioluminescent bacteria, and I love them. I don't even know what they look like, actually, individually. But it's cool that you can go in water and just move, and it glows around you. They're very, very cool. I also am obsessed with fireflies because uh, growing up, I had never seen a firefly. The first time I saw a firefly was when I moved to Texas, and I was like, oh, my God, that's the most magical thing I've ever seen. So I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. Last question, would you get sea animals? Fun segue. Um, we are working on a coral reef tank. Uh, we're gonna do a saltwater tank here at Alveus so we can talk about marine conservation. We're gonna have a cam in there, a live cam in there. Um, so Lindsay is gonna head that project. Lindsay is currently animal care staff here. She's getting her uh, master's in conservation of marine predators. And she is going to do the research for that tank, um, figure out a budget for it, and then we're gonna we're gonna set it up. How big? I don't know. Not like Georgie enclosure big, because Georgie's enclosure is huge, but large enough to where, you know, we can have several things in it, and you guys can see it well on a camera, and we can talk about coral bleaching, and we can talk more about marine conservation because it's very important. So excited about that. Um, Guys, that is it for Animal Quest today. I appreciate, I know it was a bit of a smaller group today, but thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope you learned a little bit. I hope you like bugs just a little bit more. Um, tomorrow, we have Superstars with Georgie, okay? Superstars is another series on this channel where we give an ambassador here at Alveus a very special day. Our Superstars for tomorrow is Georgie. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. CT, so the same time this stream started, Georgie uh, is an African bullfrog. He doesn't do, like, that much. <laughs> so it's not like we can give him an enrichment item for him to interact with because he won't, he won't do it. He'll, he just he'll, he sits there. So we're going to perform a magic show for him tomorrow. Connor and I and Ella and Alex and Caleb will all be um, doing magic for Georgie. And we will talk a little bit about frogs and amphibians and amphibian conservation. We'll have a live Georgie reaction camera and uh, it'll be his first magic show that he's ever watched. And the good news is we're all, have you prepared any tricks? I have prepared five actually. I am ready. I'm taking this very seriously. And so is Connor. It's going to be great. So tomorrow at 11 a.m. CT, we have Georgie's magic show, a uh, Zooperstars African Bullfrog Edition. Um, so I will see you tomorrow for that. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you guys tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow at 11. Goodbye, everybody. We're going to start the raid. We're starting the raid. Connor, 24 hour. Connor's birthday stream is tomorrow. Are you doing a 24 hour tomorrow? No. No. Filibuster, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, TJ Brown. Thanks for being here. Um, 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 um. Connor's birthday stream is tomorrow night. It's Connor's birthday tomorrow. What? 
Go ahead. You hear that? Don't seed bomb where there's a bunch of pesticides because then you'll just be baiting insects to their death. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.